So first of all, in verse 23, Moses' parents. For faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was an ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now that's odd, isn't it? Because we have said straight away, well, by faith they stuck him in a little basket and put him in the rushes. And actually, think about that one. Put a video for you. Baby Moses, Exodus 2, 3. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. Many years later, after Joseph and all his brothers had died, Pharaoh was the new king of Egypt. He feared the children of Jacob, now called the Israelites. Israelites are growing too strong. If there is a war, they may fight against us and defeat us. To keep this from happening, he made the Israelites into slaves and put Egyptian masters over them. They were forced to work very hard, making bricks and mortar. Pharaoh used the bricks to build great cities. But no matter how unkind the Egyptian slave masters were, or how hard their work became, the Israelites continued to grow in number. Pharaoh became so angry, he passed a cruel law, ordering every baby boy born to an Israelite family to be drowned in the Nile River. Now it happened that a baby boy was born to an Israelite family. Fearing Pharaoh's decree, the mother hid the baby for months. But when he began to cry and move about, she had to do something to save him. She decided to make a large basket out of the reeds that grew near the river. She sealed it with sticky tar so it would float. Then she put the baby in the basket and set it among the reeds along the river bank. His sister Miriam stood at a distance to watch over the baby. That evening, Pharaoh's daughter went down to the river to bathe. It was then she noticed the strange basket floating on the reeds. Fetch that basket, she said to her servant girl. When she opened the basket and saw the little baby boy, she loved him. Then Miriam came forth and said, Would you like for me to get an Israelite woman to take care of the baby? Yes, I would, said the princess. So Miriam ran back to get her mother and told her the things that had happened. Take care of this baby and bring him back to me when he is older. The princess said, When the child grew older, his mother took him to Pharaoh's palace, back to the princess, and he became her son. The princess named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. There's the background then. The parents under pressure, aren't they? Of course, we know nothing about what it's like to be a parent under pressure, but certainly we know nothing about what it's like to be a parent under that sort of pressure. Imagine. Imagine all the baby boys that are being born have to be hidden. Can you try hiding a baby? They don't like you. I was, I was listening to a program on Radio 4 this week about the um, Second World War, the, the prisoner run, you know, getting out of Europe over the Pyrenees, over the mountain passes in the winter and all the rest of it. And it's quite an interesting program. And there was a very harrowing sort of account there of babies being carried. You know, what do we do with this child? If this child cries, we're all lost. Put a piece of cloth in its mouth. Put a piece of cloth in its mouth. Or keep on feeding it. it. <laughs> or ideal, keep on feeding it. Ideal solution. Keep on feeding it. Keep on feeding it, sweeties. Yeah. The ideal kind of, obviously, a very practical young man. On this. <laughs> but, but you can see the problem that Moses' parents have got. Apparently, there are sort of um, myths, legends, and um, accounts of some sort of another. That you know they were taking, they were taking Egyptian babies into houses where they suspected that perhaps babies were being hidden and, and pricking them with a pin so to make them cry because about one baby will start another one off. Can you imagine the sort of pressure that these parents are under? Moses' parents, horrendous situation. You can read all about it in, in Exodus two, Exodus one fifteen to twenty two tells us how the king of Egypt as was in that little video, tried to wipe out the Israelites having their children killed at birth. Horrible, horrible situation. And then Amram and Jochebed, Moses' parents, 
trusting God enough to become parents in the first place, of course, under such circumstances, raising their child for three months in circumstances where any found Hebrew male children were, were taken away, killed, or actively being sought out. Imagine that, hiding your child on pain of death while the Egyptians were searching for boys like him to kill them. Can you imagine trying to keep that newborn quiet? The situation of these two Hebrew parents was they trusted in God <coughs> with their difficult circumstance. And as it always does, faith drove out fear. Now, I've been saying this recently to some of the students down in Cardiff and stuff, and I'm trying to get people to see this. The, the opposite of faith is not intellectual doubt. If we deal with intellectual doubt, we haven't created faith. Do you see the point? The point is that the opposite of faith is fear. Because faith is actually trusting in God, putting your active trust in Him. So the opposite of faith is not intellectual doubt as such. Faith is a, a moral choice. We decide that we're going to entrust our lives to our God to live in a particular way. So just tackling people's intellectual doubts and giving them all this apologetic stuff. Um, yeah, fine, great, yeah, I can understand that. But actually, the opposite of faith is fear. And these people, putting their trust in the one true living God, exercising faith, their faith, Hebrews here tells us, drove out their fear. Their situation was an impossible one, really, in so many ways. So they resorted to God, who would plainly be their only possible helper in a situation like this. Who else are you going to trust in? They put their trust in God. Now think about that for a minute. How much do they know about God at this stage? We were having this discussion a bit last time, weren't we? About how far you've got along the unveiling and revealing of the will of God. Folks, last time. How far along God telling people stuff they need to know? How far along have they come? If they go back now, in terms of what they know about the dealings of God with his people and stuff, and, and look at um, the question of how, how God rescues people, where are they going to go back in the history of Israel up to that point? They haven't got, you know, they haven't got far to go back, have they? Where are they going to go? Why well, wouldn't you go back to Noah? Where's the big picture of where God has actually redeemed, rescued his people from an awful circumstance? In, in the Old Testament so far, it's Noah, isn't it? Can you see them working through in their minds? I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking this through, I'm working this out myself. But, but if they're going to go back somewhere, they're going to go back to God rescuing, this is build a boat. And then there's Amram and Jacobed sitting around the fire trying to keep the baby quiet and having a chat at night, whatever it is. They, God can rescue through water, yeah. God can rescue with a boat. And I know, I'll make a little boat. You can just see a mind running, can't you? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to work this through you. I said, I'll make a boat for this baby, and I'll put him in the boat, and I'll sleep it up with pitch underneath, because I know Pharaoh's daughter comes down to the water to bring, and I know she hasn't got any kids, and I know she'd love to have a child. So there's faith, and there's rationality, and there's prayerful meditation going on. What's the most important thing to do? The prayer thing. Who wants to say pray? I oh, don't know, don't, 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 don't go there. Let's not go down that road. Very famous instance in the 50s where Dr. Lloyd Jones was in a student gathering, an IFPs gathering, and this question came up. And um, the question was raised, and he said, Oh, pray, pray, Dr. Pray. He said, Oh, pray. No. no. You better think before you pray. I don't know whether these people had thought before they prayed or what they'd done, but certainly they thought about putting their trust in God and trusting their child and how they were going to deal with it, because they think, right, we'll, we'll, we'll rationalise it, we'll see this seems reasonable, we'll do this, and Miriam will be hiding in the bushes to see what comes on. And Miriam, here's the plan. If, if the princess comes along and says, I'll take the baby, fine, and she, you jump out and say, would you, would you like me to get a nursemaid for you, to nurse the baby for you? Bring your man. It's an audacious thing to do. It's a very daring, bold, brave thing to do when it's driven by their trust in God because He is their only hope. So they resort to God. How has God stepped in to save people? Well, they, they've got paradigms for that from their knowledge and understanding of Noah. And they acted on that faith. Both hiding him for three months first to get him started and then floating his little boat on the land. 
Pharaoh decreed all Hebrew baby boys have to make a trip to the river from which they wouldn't be coming back. They'd be drowned and fed to the crocs in the river. They take their son, they put him in a little boat and entrust him to God. It takes an awful lot of doing. Doesn't it take an awful lot of doing to trust ourselves to God? Aren't there days when that's a difficult, difficult thing to do? And come on, how many of us have to wrestle with this whole idea of trusting your child? And trusted God to take care of it. To take care of the details. And to take care of their little son because they could see that God had a plan and a purpose in this boy's life. It takes an awful lot of doing what they're doing. And God honors their faith. I knew how the story works out. Moses' mother gets to look after him and to raise him. And she seems to have had the chance to have taught Moses to live his life by faith too. How cool is that? Because when it comes to his turn, verses 24 to 6, Moses in Egypt, second thing to look at, he chooses to make the costly choice of faith as well. So his parents have made that costly choice of faith, and they've looked and they've found that God has given them the opportunity to teach that young lad growing up in Pharaoh's household has been able to teach him to live his life trusting in God. And now he seems to have learned that lesson because by faith, verse 24, Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Huh? What? He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. What, what sort of pleasures are open to a guy who's grown up as the son of Pharaoh's daughter? Look at all the families around the world. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because the material wealth of the place was open to him as well. Why would he do a thing like that? Youthful rebelliousness? You are not my mother! <laughs> no, Hebrews says, it's because he was looking ahead to his reward. That's the life of faith, isn't it? 